Hey guys, Dr. Yerby here. In this video, I want to talk to you about what is digital forensics or cyber forensics. So I've got a couple slides here. We'll jump into that and then I'll add a couple other things. So digital forensics, cyber forensics, computer forensics all sound very similar. Uh, there, there, there are slight nuances there. Uh, I think computer forensics, we're really talking about the computer. Digital is everything digital. Cyber is the latest buzzword. I think if you're looking in the textbook that we're using for the class right now, it'll probably say digital forensics as my slide does right here. But really what they're doing is pretty similar. It's the application of computer science. <clears throat> so forensics is part science and I'll argue that it's also part art and I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. Uh, to investigate procedures. So science, things have to always be repeatable. We have to be able to reproduce what we find. Uh, procedures, uh, when we're going through and we're doing forensics, we need to have procedures in place. We need to know we're using this type of tool to do this type of operation. Uh, typically for a legal purpose involving the analysis of digital evidence. So legal purpose, legal can mean criminal, it can mean civil, uh, it can also mean something outside the court system, such as, uh, you know, losing your job or something like that, right? After the proper search authority, so this is saying after the person that's allowed to search it. So if you're a police officer, you have different rights than if you are a business owner and you're trying to search something on that computer that you own as a business. Chain of custody. This is a really big, important principle that will cover much more through your reading and through other, other videos. Uh, but chain of custody is really one of the foundations of forensics. We need to know uh, where the evidence has been, who had it, when did they have it, why did they have it. And we need to be able to document everywhere that evidence has gone from bad guy to investigator A to investigator B to investigator C to storage locker and then you know report uh, for court purposes. Validation with mathematics. So that's just saying uh, there's this really important concept called hashing that essentially it gives you a fingerprint of a file. So we can say that when we took a file or when we took a computer or when we took an image, and we'll get into to what those, those words mean later, that we can show scientifically that we are really, really sure that that file has not changed. So we have not violated the integrity of the evidence. Use of validated tools. Again, there's plenty of tools. I could write one today. Maybe not me, but somebody with a little bit more programming experience could write one today. Uh, but would we know that that tool has been validated? Would we know that that tool does what the person says it does? So uses a validated tool. It's repeatable, right? That goes back to our scientific principles. Uh, reporting, that's that last little piece that uh, many people that initially say, oh, forensics is so cool. They, they love the science. They love the investigation. They love the analysis. But it's that reporting that if you don't do the reporting, everything else was for naught. Uh, so the reporting becomes very important as well. Uh, sometimes your report goes and speaks for you and you never get to speak. The report speaks for you. And possible expert presentation. That's the part where you do get to speak. So... Uh, let's see. In October 2012, an ISO standard for forensics was ratified, ISO 27037, uh, Information Technology Security Techniques. Uh, related to this are the federal rules of evidence. And again, we'll talk about this more as we go through the semester. Uh, it was created to ensure consistency in federal proceedings. It's been signed into law since 1973. Many states... Uh, many state rules map to the FRE, but not all. There's there's really two different schools of thought, and I don't want to get into that because it'll make this video much longer. Uh, but this is used in many states, but not all states. Uh, the FBI CART 
the computer analysis and response team, was only formed in 1984, which is not that long ago. So this field, even though you have probably at least heard of it or watched a terrible TV show about it, uh, it's still a pretty young field and a pretty developing, you know, growing, developing field. Uh, by the late 90s, CART teamed up with the Department of Defense Computer Laboratory, DCFL. And then also uh, added in here, there are different amendments that come into play uh, in digital forensics. Of course, when, when the, the Constitution was written, they were not uh, thinking of computers uh, very, very likely, right? Uh, but some of the amendments do extend nicely into computer forensics. Uh, the first one here is the Fourth Amendment. It's the uh, one that protects you from unreasonable searches. You know, so everyone has a right for secure search and seizure. Separate search warrants might not be necessary for digital evidence. Uh, I would I would advocate that if you are going into this field, especially you're going into this field as a law enforcement officer, uh, anytime you're searching, anytime you're trying to conduct an investigation, it's much better to have the search warrant um, to search for what you need to find for your case uh, and then then proceed. There's been plenty of cases where uh, law enforcement have gone fishing is what, what the uh, defense will usually call it stumbled upon some additional evidence and then that evidence has been inadmissible uh, because it wasn't found under the search warrant that they were granted uh, every u.s jurisdiction has case law related to the admissibility of evidence recovered from computers and other digital evidence uh, then the other amendment that's not listed on this slide but i wanted to go ahead and add into this this video is the fifth amendment and you probably heard of the fifth when people say, I'm taking the fifth, right? So the way that that factors into cyber forensics is taking the fifth. You, you don't have to testify against yourself, right? And how does, how does your computer work that way? If you have a computer and it's password protected, you are not mandated to help the investigator out. If you're, you know, you're the person under investigation and there's something on that computer that could possibly harm you or convict you, you're not mandated to help. So if you're forced into it or coerced into it, that could be violating your Fifth Amendment right. There are exceptions, especially with mobile phones. A Supreme Court ruled a few years ago that, that, um, you, if your passcode is your fingerprint, that the law enforcement officer can use your fingerprint. They they try to do an appeal to that that ruling initially, saying, but uh, the law enforcement officer made us tell them which finger, and so their their rebuttal was, don't tell us which finger. We'll just try these ten, All right? And so that's that was kind of how that case went. Uh, one last thing I wanted to add in here that's kind of uh, really appropriate for introducing what digital forensics is, is this low cards exchange principle. Uh, so essentially it states whenever two objects come in contact, a transfer of material occurs, right? And so it's essentially saying that with forensics, when you do something to something, like when you log onto a computer or you enter a room or you stab a person, something is going to change in the universe, in that room, and it's going to leave behind some evidence. Then it becomes an investigator's job to figure out, can they figure out what that evidence is? So we're going to jump into many of these topics much more deeply and uh, looking forward to it. Thanks.